Hey you, if you're enjoying the podcast, do us a favor and go into your podcast app right now and tap the subscribe button so you never miss a new episode. And I know it's a giant pain, but it would mean the world to us if you would take two minutes to leave us a rating and a review. We'll be sure to give you a shout out on future episodes. Dark Cast Network. The light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Hey, y'all. I'm Gina. And I'm Amber. Welcome back to Weird True Crime. Since we are well into spooky season now, we wanted to do something a little different this week. Amber had the awesome idea to cover one of her favorite spooky movies and the tragedy that surrounded it, The Crow. The Crow premiered in 1993 and starred Brandon Lee, who was killed during the making of the movie. We're going to talk about all aspects of the film, including the story that inspired the original comic, Brandon Lee and his life, and all of the ominous, tragic things that happened during the filming of the movie. We're going to kick things off with talking about the background of the comic and the man who created it. So let's get into it. I'm excited about this. James O'Barr is the author of the comic. He was assigned the birth date of January 1st, 1960. And I say assigned because he was born to a woman who was in and out of mental institutions, jails and hospitals throughout her adult life. I saw sources saying that she was an alcoholic schizophrenic. It was during one of her many cycles of rock bottom incarceration rehab and release that she had him somewhere in between Christmas Day and New Year's, quote, quote. James and his older half-brother were taken to an orphanage in Detroit, where he spent most of his childhood. His older half-brother was sick with TB, which people were terrified at the time, so they were isolated and basically left to entertain themselves. This is when James started drawing on anything and everything he could. Any coloring book he received in the orphanage was already destroyed, so he would pull down flyers and just take to drawing and stuff on the back of them. They were adopted late into his childhood, probably around the age of seven, but unfortunately, things did not get much better. His adoptive father was a bus driver for the city of Detroit, and his mother worked for IHOP. Since she couldn't afford a babysitter, she would drop him off at the movie theater next to the restaurant where he would spend the entire day watching the same movie over and over. He said during a podcast interview back in 2014, the first time I'd watch it, the second time I'd study it, the third time I'd pick it apart, try to understand why they chose a particular camera angle. He spent a lot of his time at the library reading and drawing as he wasn't allowed to do so at home since his parents considered it a waste of time and didn't believe you could make a living off of drawing. Mm-hmm. They were a little surprised after that. <laughs> he showed them. He showed them. As a re- result of his struggles adjusting to his new family, James moved in with his girlfriend, Beverly, at the age of 17, and they agreed to get married after graduation. Now, I saw some sources say that her name was Bethany, but most of the ones that I saw Her name was Beverly, so I'm going to leave it at Beverly. Beverly, unfortunately, was the victim of a drunk driver who struck her with his van while she walked alone on a sidewalk and dragged her across several front yards. Oh, that's horrible. I looked and looked for that story. You know, back in the 70s, though, there wasn't anything that I could find. and I'm sure it wasn't considered newsworthy, unfortunately. Not like today. No. Uh, They, the family probably didn't want, didn't want that out there either. Yeah. Poor James was notified of the accident by her father over the phone, but he was with her family at the hospital when she she was pronounced dead. Shortly after that, he joined the Marines seeking an escape as well as structure. Once the Marines discovered James could draw, they assigned him to re-illustrating manuals, all of which had been around since World War II and were full of stereotypical and racist image, which he was not having any of that. He went through and he, he spent two years redrawing these illustrations, removing any racist elements in them. One manual that left lasting impression on James was a manual about disposing of dead bodies and body parts. He felt that violence should be ugly as possible, and it influenced the way he depicts violence in his comics, and you can see that. So after two years, his adoptive father passed away. He received an early discharge, and he headed back to the States with the full intention of seeking revenge against the driver of the van that stole Beverly from him. Unfortunately, 
or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, the driver had already passed due to natural causes. I mean, that is sad. But at the same time, I think it's good he didn't go through life trying to get revenge on someone. Like, it's not the closure he wanted, but it is no. some sort of closure. He, Yeah, he was definitely seeking closure. He was going through a severe self-destructive phase. Of course. There was times where he was stationed in Berlin and he would go to the bar at night and just get into bar fight after bar fight. I can't really blame him. Unfortunately, that's how men especially deal with their their trauma. Their trauma. So thankfully, he kind of readjusted and turned to his drawing and he created this comic as sort of an outlet for that grief and pain. Obar has said many times that writing The Crow was influenced in part by the tragic loss of his fiance Beverly, but also in part uh, by a news story published in 1999 where a couple was killed over a $20 engagement ring. I looked and looked for that original story as well, but I wasn't able to find it. After its creation, The Crow was independently published by comic store owner turned comic publisher Caliber Press. It rose in popularity with high profile rock bands as it was littered with Joy Division lyric homages to Iggy Pop and The Cure. That's pretty cool. The Crow set itself apart from all the other comics of its time. Nowhere to be found were colorful spandex capes and big muscles. And in its place with, was goth and horror. It's not up my alley or anything. No, I don't have I have no idea why you like this. No clue. <laughs> Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. I'm CJ, host of Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. My episodes focus on crimes committed by and against the LGBTQ community. I've covered cases you probably have heard of, such as Matthew Shepard, Brandon Tina, and the Orlando Pulse nightclub massacre, as well as some lesser known cases like the murder of Ray Hainish, the Australian gay beat murders, and the suspicious disappearance of Lisa Lynn Stone. I cover cases brought to me by listeners like Penny Brummer, who I believe was wrongfully convicted, taboo cases such as lesbian corrective rape and murder in South Africa, and Pray the Gay Away camps. I discuss gay serial killers, women who pretend to be men to hook up with other women, and trans murders. I'm opinionated and uncensored, I know I'm not everyone's cup of tea, but surely I'm someone shot at tequila. No matter what your gender or orientation in life might be, please join me as I tackle rainbow crimes in search of unicorn justice. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay, unless you're a murderer. The comic was finally published on February 1st, 1989. The main character in the comic is Eric Draven, and Obar said that his inspiration for the appearance of the character is mainly from his face, Baja Singer, Peter Murphy, and his body, Iggy Pop. Looking at the comic is intense. Everything is just as you would expect from the comic. Gory, dark, twisted, but the lighter portions where Eric is remembering Shelley are beautiful. Mm -hmm. You can feel the love and grief and pain and anger pouring out at you through the pages. So in 1993, the comic was adapted into the movie directed by Alex Proyas and co-written co by David J. Shaw and John Shirley. James O'Barr was invited to participate in the film's production and met and became friends with Brandon Lee, who was cast at the lead. The Crow was one of the first comic to movie adaptations, which is largely forgotten as it isn't your normal Marvel or DC comic superhero story. And that's that's such a cool little like tidbit of information because I didn't realize that this was a comic first. And I don't know that a lot of people besides like the really cult, the cult followers of it would no. Nope. And so it's it's pretty cool to think of this as like the first movie adaptation of a comic and that it wasn't at all what you would think of. No. I mean, nowadays it's like everything is from a comic turned into a movie. So that's mm -hmm. so 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 common back then you wouldn't think that. Mm -hmm. But seriously though, like this comic is not your typical like I, I don't even know that it, calling it really a comic is justification for what it's it's not the right feel whenever you're looking through More it. like maybe like a graphic novel sort of sort of I mean it's still I mean still definitely the the build of it is still definitely a comic but you can tell that when James was writing this like he literally was pouring every emotion he had into this comic so now we're getting into the movie People 
believed that when someone dies, a crow carries their soul to the land of the dead. But sometimes something so bad happens that a terrible sadness is carried with it and the soul can't rest. Then sometimes, just sometimes, the crow can bring that soul back to put the wrong things right. This is how the movie starts, and it has stuck with me ever since I first heard Sarah say these words. Just as the comic is dark, the movie is also void of most colors beyond black, white, gray, and some red. In a nutshell, it is about a man and a woman who are murdered on Devil's Night, October 30th, in Detroit, Michigan, the night before their wedding day. A year later, a crow brings back the man, rock and roll musician Eric Draven. Eric relives those final moments of his life when he and his fiance were brutally murdered, and he is filled with grief and rage. He dons the signature black and white face paint, black leather pants, and a black long sleeve shirt as he joins the crow who resurrected him in seeking out all those who played a part in the murder of him and his fiance Shelley. One by one, he hunts down the main four men and exacts his revenge. Throughout his vengeance, he does not go unnoticed by the police and has a few interactions with a beat cop by the name of Albrecht. He inadvertently comes into contact with a young girl named Sarah, who he and Shelley had taken care of while they were alive as her mother was less than reliable. Eric and the Crow finally make their way all the way to the leader of the gang that was ultimately responsible for his and Shelley's deaths. I won't spoil the ending, but Eric is finally able to rest and be with his beloved Shelley. Having rewatched it recently, it sticks with you. And Brandon did such a good job of bringing in that emotion and just that Mm -hmm. raw pain. Mm -hmm. He deserves all the credit in the world for what he brought to that role. Absolutely. He's this movie has some of my absolute favorite quotes of all time. And there are so many quotes that stuck with me other than that first one that I mentioned for many reasons, whether they were thought provoking, relatable or just funny. Mm -hmm. Here, Here are a few of my my other top favorites. Top dollar says childhood's over the moment you know you're gonna die. That was a thought provoking one when I was younger. It's like as a kid, you think oh, I'm going to go play Barbies and cars and all of this. You don't have a care in the world, but you get to that age when you realize death is a thing. And one day that will happen to you. It's like your entire world shifts, your entire way of thinking shifts. So that's that one's always stuck with me. And then a few of the funnier quotes in the movie that just kill me. <laughs> Eric says, Mr. Gideon, you're not paying attention. <laughs> do you remember when that one? I can't say that I do. So we were talking earlier about how Eric portrays this sinister type of role, but he also has a little bit of a goofball side to him. When he says this particular quote, he's in Gideon's pawn shop. Okay, okay. And he jumps up on the counter and he disappears up into the sky or up into the ceiling. And then the next thing you know, he's swinging upside down, hanging upside down above Gideon. And he says, Mr. Gideon, you're not paying attention. Just he brings that little goofball element into it. (laughs) Another one of my favorite quotes is whenever he's uh, exacting his revenge on one of the Goonies is victims, aren't we all? (laughs) I actually have this one tattooed on me in the movie. It's from a song lyric because Eric's band Hangman's Joke. uh, This is one of the lyrics in there. It says it can't rain all the time. What a poignant phrase. It's very simple, but it says a lot. Everything sucks, but it's not always going to be this bad. Things will get better. And this is coming from a person who's exacting revenge on the <laughs> on the murder of his fiance and himself. And he's even oh. saying, hey, it can't be bad all the time. If he can feel that way, then shouldn't we all be able to feel that way? <laughs> Thank. Yeah. Sarah is the narrator. She had that first quote. And then she says another one that definitely stuck with me as well. If the people we love are stolen from us, the way to have them live on is to never stop loving them. Buildings burn, people die, but real love is forever. Yeah, that's a really good one too. Yeah. I had mentioned that Sarah, the young girl, her mom was less than reliable. Eric intervenes with her in the movie and he says something to her. Mother is the name for God on the lips and hearts of all children. As a mom, you know, I watched the Obviously, I watched this movie before I became a mom. But now being a mom and having that just... Oof, that's a, that's an oof right into the feels. Watching him say that to her and the look on her face, like, oh God, I've messed up so yep. hard. I, I felt like that was a very big moment mm-hmm. in the movie because not only is he trying to seek out revenge for his own selfish reasons, but he's also trying to help this girl. Well, when he was alive, him and Shelly... Yeah. Looked after Sarah. So even in death, he's still trying to look after her and help. Mm -hmm. 
So, okay. After all these quotes, I'm going to end it with another one of my favorites, just like one of those simple, like small touching moments. Sarah says, what are you supposed to be a clown or something? (laughs) And he replies, sometimes (laughs) just, it just that cute little, yeah. As with all paper to screen adaptations, there's always going to be differences. There's some things you have to write out due to time constraints to do to physical incapabilities of portraying it or just to make the story make a little bit more sense if you're putting it on the big screen. So some of the most notable differences that I know that are from the comic to the movie, the main one is something that I actually didn't really know until I got my hands on the comic and was doing more of this research into the story. There is a character in the comic called Skull Cowboy. This character was cut primarily due to Brandon's passing. Okay. So the Skull Cowboy was to be played by the actor Michael Berryman. Most of his dialogue through the movie had already been recorded, except for his dialogue with Eric. So when he passed away, they had to, to obviously make some cuts. So in the comic... The Skull Cowboy is basically serving as Eric's guide throughout his seeking revenge. In the movie, it's it's just the crow. Well, the crow is still in the comic along with Skull Cowboy, but there's a voice to what's happening, explaining to Eric where, why he's been brought back. And there's more information given to you. And I think they did a pretty good job with just using the crow, explaining why Eric's back, what, what has happened and, actually serving as his guide with the flashbacks and everything. Yeah, definitely. I think that I, I do think that overall it would have changed the feel of the movie had they kept in the Skull Cowboy. The deletion and rewriting of the script kind of made the movie feel softer and focus was kept more on the love story between Eric and Shelley. Mm-hmm. And so Sarah's introduction he has those two great quotes from the movie were used instead of what was supposed to be an introduction or narration from the Skull Cowboy. That's super interesting. Um, It's hard. I'm not as familiar with the comic as you are, but it's hard for me to imagine there being another person there. Another element to it. Yep. Because, I mean, the movie just feels so... Whole. It feels complete. Complete. So another difference is Officer Albrecht is a combination of two different characters from the comic, a rookie cop and Captain Hook, the officer that actually stayed by Eric's bedside at the hospital. In the movie, Officer Albrecht stayed at Shelley's bedside for 30 hours in the ICU. Interesting. Another little difference uh, was Sarah's character was named Sherry in the comic, probably just because they changed it from Sherry because it sounded too close to Shelley get those two confused pretty easy but overall character concept is still the same the last one would be top dollar became the main villain in the movie where he's just actually a supporting gang member with his own crew in the comic yeah again i can't imagine top dollar not being the head honcho behind all of the the nonsense and the garbage but and there's a there's obviously more subtle and not so subtle differences, but those are the ones that stand out the most to me. As someone who is familiar or more familiar with the comic versus the movie, do you feel like any of those changes made any sort of negative impact on the movie? Honestly, the comic is its own beast, its own entity. Just because the story is based on the comic, it's its own thing. Okay. The movie is complete and perfect the way that it is and the comic the way that it is like i think that you know the movie ended up with the rewrites and everything ended up how it should have got it it's not like one of those situations where you've got the book versus the movie situation in my opinion it's not one of those cases where you get done watching the movie and you just throw your hands up like well that was garbage yeah this, you know, this from the comic was so much better. And then no, I don't feel like anything like that. I think that they both kind of stay in their own lanes and appreciated for what they are. I couldn't imagine the movie any other way. It's perfect. <laughs> Brand Brandon was perfect. <sighs> perfect. Perfect for the role. Yeah. And on that note, we are going to get into talking about Brandon Lee and who he was before the crow. 
For those who don't know, Brandon Lee was actually Bruce Lee's firstborn son, and he was born in Oakland, California on February 1st of 1965. He was the first child of Bruce Lee, the legendary martial artist, and his wife, Linda Lee Cadwell. And as you can imagine, Brandon began training in martial arts at an extremely young age, and his grandmother said that he could kick through a one-inch board by the time he was five, which is insane, and I couldn't do that now. So the fact that he could do that at five is super cool. (laughs) Well, I mean, when you're the son of a legend, it's... High expectations. Yep. (laughs) His younger sister, Shannon, was born in 1969, so she was four years younger than him. Fun note, Brandon was born with thick black hair, and it all fell out, but it came back in as bright blonde which is really hard to imagine. Um, (laughs) And like many people with light hair as children, it darkened as he got older and changed from super straight to wavy, which he obviously got from his mom's side of the family with the waviness of the hair. Yeah, Uh, But he's... He was a very attractive man, so it worked very well for him. I'm just going to very well gonna say that. Throw that out there. <laughs> Shannon, Brandon's sister, said that he moved a lot like his father, and he learned so easily and he could do things after being shown the first time. The family moved back and forth between California and Hong Kong for Bruce's career. And unfortunately, when Brandon was eight, Bruce suddenly died in 1973 at the age of 32 in an apartment in Hong Kong. It was said that he had some sort of fluid on his brain or something. There's a lot of different stories about what actually happened. And I don't want to sit here and say this is what it was, because honestly, I don't really know which one to believe. But Either way, Bruce Lee died at the age of 32, which is very sad because he was a very huge star in his own right. Of course, Brandon was very, very close to his father. And so after he died, he didn't speak for a while. And this was something that Shannon spoke about on the Bruce Lee podcast. Uh, She also said that after their father died, they went to stay in Canada with their aunt and uncle for several weeks while their mother went back to Hong Kong to sort through all of their possessions. And while they were there, their aunt decided that this was when Shannon should stop using her blankie, when her father just died. (laughs) And this is a great (laughs) this is a great time to take away a kid's safety safety net timing. Yeah. So Brandon got very defensive and protective of her and fought against this for his sister and got up and yelled at his aunt and was like, how dare you take my sister's blankie from her? And she she remembers this very lovingly. And she said that he maintained this fatherly protectiveness over her for the rest of his life. And he helped guide her and prepare her for high school and college, telling her to pick classes that interested her and then take more from there. Another funny thing that she said was there was this time when she was probably 22 or so, and she was in a room with him and a bunch of his friends. And his friends were talking about sex or something else like that. And after she left the room, he yelled at his friends for talking about sex in front of his little sister, uh, even though she was a fully grown adult at the time. (laughs) (laughs) But I just I thought that was such a funny little remark and kind of showed who he was. Inside is who he was. Just a good big brother. Yeah, he was a very caring, just all around good guy. And Brandon loved to read, and he actually carried a dictionary with him. So if he came across a word he didn't know, he could look it up in the dictionary, which I thought was really funny. He got a perfect score on the English portion of his SAT. His favorite book was Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and he actually was a really big fan of motorcycles. So that makes sense. That's just the most random. I, he was, I love it. He was a quirky guy. Uh, he was clearly. He was also very theatrical and loved telling stories. While growing up in Seattle, Brandon had a fort in their house with a padlock on it, and apparently he was allowed to lock it as long as his mother Linda had a spare key so she could get into it anytime she wanted to. 
And one day they heard meowing coming from the fort and their mother found a kitten inside. And Brandon told her the story about how he found a kitten in the gutter that was near death and covered in fleas. And he brought it home to save it and nurse it back to life. And Linda, of course, fell for this. And so they named it Samson after the figure in the Bible and his representation of overcoming diversity. Well, years later, Brandon actually admitted to his mother that his friend's cat had had kittens and he just brought one home and then made up this story about how he saved its life so she would <laughs> let him keep it. <laughs> yeah, why didn't I think of that? I know. So even at a young age, she had a very, very creative imagination and was this amazing storyteller. He always knew that he wanted to be an actor and he copied episodes of The Twilight Zone word for word and then performed them at school for people. That would have been cool to see. I know. I would have loved to be a fly on that wall. Along with that, he loved to write. He was always creating stories. And he had a very big romanticism about him. He was also a daredevil and loved to make people laugh. He liked to skateboard and ski. He broke bones frequently and got <laughs> stitches and hurt himself a lot. And he would build skate ramps in their yard and then hurt himself on them because, of course, they weren't stable <laughs> or really meant for that. But he liked to take risks and he wasn't he wasn't afraid to get hurt. So good on him. I wouldn't be doing <laughs> anything like that. No. He also liked to take solo trips into the woods and was very into nature. Linda, their mother, she would take them on these like organized camping trips often as children. So it wasn't it wasn't as if she would just pack up a tin and go into the woods. She would go on organized trips that had been organized by other groups of people gotcha. and take gotcha. them on those. He also did this when he was older, too. So he would go on these organized camping trips and he would also go on trips by himself a lot and just go into nature and be on his own. He could read a topographic map and a compass. And he, yeah, like I said, he liked to go out into the woods by himself on his Harley when he was in his late teens, early 20s, which is definitely... So let me get this straight. He was goofy. He cared about his family. He was outdoorsy. He liked to... He was intelligent. He liked to read and write. Really? And he was pretty. That's... That's a lot of good things. It's <laughs> a lot of good things. Of course, he did have trouble in school and he acted out a lot. He was constantly challenged by other kids to prove that he was Bruce Lee's son. And this is something that followed him around for his entire life. Oh, yeah. He said in an interview with People Magazine that he always had a knack for raising hell. So, <laughs> so while he did have all of these good qualities, he also was a little bit of a bad boy. But I feel like that was something that people put on him and maybe not necessarily a reflection of who he really was. Yeah. He got expelled from high school in Los Angeles after he drove his car down the hill behind the school backward. Because going <laughs> forward wasn't enough. You know. No, Words. he enrolled in another high school in Los Angeles, but he eventually dropped out and got his GED. He was just the creative type. School was not for him. He probably got tired of all the other kids giving him hell about who he was. And honestly, I don't really blame him because he wasn't the most studious guy. He only went to college for one semester at Emerson College in Boston. He spent a lot of his free time during that semester traveling to New York. He did drop out and he did plays around town in New York and got into theater groups to perform. He took acting lessons at Lee Strasberg Theater and Film Institute. And one of his big issues was that producers wanted him for their roles because of who his father was and for martial arts roles. But honestly, he wasn't a big athlete and he didn't really practice martial arts as a child after his father died for understandable reasons. He felt a lot of pressure and a lot of the places where he was practicing had these huge pictures of his father on the walls. And how can you perform under that kind of stress? So he just, he didn't do martial arts for most of his childhood and early adulthood. And he really didn't start finding an interest in it again until he was around 19 years old, which I, I completely understand. It's not until you get older and start finding yourself again that you can really probably find that interest or love for that thing again, because... Like as he was growing up, he was just constantly in his father's shadow. He was he had big expectations to live up to. So he didn't want to do it. And then by the time he got old enough that 
he was able to get back into it and, and enjoy it, make it his own instead of the shadow of his father. Exactly. And his sister actually said that when he was making Legacy of Rage in Hong Kong, which I'll get into in a minute, that he was really difficult to work with because he was young and wanted to be a real actor and not just a martial artist because that's who everybody wanted him to be. Mm -hmm. Brandon made his way back to Los Angeles in 1985, where he worked as a script reader. And it was during this time that he was approached by a casting director and successfully auditioned for his first major role in Kung Fu, the movie, which was a made for TV movie in 1986. The movie starred David Carradine, who played a Shaolin priest named Kwai Chang Kane. Brandon was cast as Chung Wing, the young companion to a Manchu man who was on the hunt for Chang Kane and is actually his son. I'm not going to go into the plot details, but it's cool to note that the original idea for the pilot was created with Bruce Lee in mind. Brandon had to shave his head for the role and was a grasshopper type in the movie. His sister Shannon says, that if he could have had his dream, this is not how he would have started. He was very resistant to take the role because he didn't want to follow in his father's footsteps, like we've been saying, and known for martial art. He did have a lot of confidence in himself and knew what he wanted to do. He knew who he was, but he didn't rely on that in any way and wanted to be his own person. He was really starting to establish himself as being separate from his father when he died. It just seems like... Everything was pushing him into the martial arts roles, however you want to phrase it, just wanted him in that role because they missed Bruce Lee. They mm -hmm. wanted to have a replacement for him, but it's like he finally accepted the fact that he was going to have to do some of that to begin with just so he could be who he wanted to be. Right. Brandon did make his way back to Hong Kong for his first starring role in the Cantonese movie Legacy of Rage, where he played a regular good guy with a girlfriend and a jealous, troublesome friend. The friend turns on him, frames him for a crime he didn't commit, and gets him thrown in prison for 10 years. Of course, his quote-unquote friend steals the love of his life while he's in prison. When he gets out, he learns that his girlfriend, May, is dead, but that she had his son after he was sent away. He exacts revenge on the friend and takes off into the sunset with his son at the end of the movie. The movie did well in Hong Kong and had a small audience in Chinatown areas in the U.S. He was nominated for a Hong Kong Film Award for Best New Performer for his role in the movie. While it still was a martial arts movie, he did get a lot of really good recognition in Hong Kong for it. And mm -hmm. it was a great step in his career. And during this time, he was in a few other smaller roles, including a lead role starring in the Kung Fu TV series pilot, but it was never picked up for television. He also starred in a 1990 straight-to-home movie called The Laser Mission. Fun <laughs> fact, and this goes back to The Crow being the first comic book made into a movie, Dan Lee, the creator behind the gigantic Marvel world... He actually met with Brandon and his mother, Linda, in the late 1980s to discuss the possibility of Brandon playing the role of Shang-Chi, who is known as one of the most powerful fighters in the Marvel Universe. And anybody who knows anything about Marvel has seen that Shang-Chi came out, what, last year? Mm -hmm. Last year or the year before? I don't know. The past couple of years have just been a blur. But, yeah, I know. Well, Shang-Chi is now a Marvel character that we are mm -hmm. all very familiar with. And so I thought that this was like a really cool fact that in the 80s, Stan Lee had looked at him and talked to him about playing this role. Yep. Stan Lee was determined to make a movie or TV series with the character, but networks weren't interested at the time because of the violence portrayed in the comics. And Stan Lee felt that Brandon was perfect for this role, and he had a great hope for him, saying that he would be a future star, which he definitely would have been. Yes, well, definitely. Were he still with us. Brandon was also offered a role where he'd be playing his father in the movie Dragon, the Bruce Lee story, but he turned it down, saying that it was awkward to play his father and not wanting to portray the romance between his parents, which, yeah, would be really weird. 
don't kids have nightmares about that kind of stuff anyway? Like why? Yeah, no, I don't want to pretend to do that in a... No. Nope. Nope. Good call. It was his role in Legacy of Rage that ultimately led him to be being sought after by movie producer Robert Lawrence and cast in his next role in the States, which was Showdown in Little Tokyo. This movie co-starred Dolph Lundgren, The two play cops who are partnered to fight against the Yakuza's, which is an organized crime syndicate that originated in Japan. The movie didn't get many positive reviews, but it was still a good step in his career because the producer, Lawrence, saw his potential and brought him into the development of his next film, Rapid Fire. Brandon got to be involved in every aspect of the making of Rapid Fire, including story and character development, and connected deeply with the character because of the loss of the character's father. He even choreographed most of his own fight scenes for the film. Lawrence compared Brandon and his father, Bruce, saying his father had a burning intensity on screen. Brandon's more fun. He's freewheeling, hip, and tongue-in-cheek. It was during the filming of Rapid Fire that he landed the role of Eric Draven in The Crow. He was so proud of his work with Rapid Fire that he told the Baltimore Sun that he'd like to be able to show it to his dad and that he was proud of what they'd accomplished within the framework of the action-adventure formula. So at this point, he's getting super excited about the direction that his career is going. Finally taking, yep. Yeah, and he's so he's so proud of it that he can even say in an interview, I really wish that I could show my father, Bruce Lee, where I'm at. Yep. And it took a really long time for him to be able to even talk about the fact that he was Bruce Lee's son. And here he is coming into his own, finally, just mm-hmm. before his life gets cut short. And he he understood that being being Bruce Lee's son helped him get access that he wouldn't have had normally, but it pigeonholed him into a genre that wasn't where he wanted his career to be, which is what we've been talking about. And he was using the action genre to help him move over to more dramatic roles. He was really excited to get The Crow because even though it did have action in it, it was very dark and intense. The bittersweet thing about The Crow is that it was such a dark movie and Brandon himself was so light. And that was what his sister said, you know, it's 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 just so sad because he really made a name for himself in that movie. And it was such a dark, intense role, which was the opposite of everything that he was as a person. But you can see little glimpses of that in the movie, too. Absolutely. I think it's great that you do get to see those little light moments where you mm-hmm. can see who he who he really was as a person yeah. outside of yep. this dark, dark character. Just a little bit more about his personal life. He met his fiance, Eliza Hutton, in 1990 at a director's office where she worked as his assistant. The two began living together in 1991 and had set a wedding date. April 17th, 1993, just a week after Brandon was set to finish filming The Crow. In an interview with People Magazine in 1992, Eliza said that when she first met Brandon, she thought he was arrogant, but he's not. He's confident, intense, and direct, and a lot of people find that intimidating. I said that I had a little tidbit that I wanted to keep for while we were recording what you know yeah you what you noticed rewatching the movie so while i was watching the movie there's a scene where brandon is looking through pictures of eric and shelly together and there's a picture where it's shelly's back and it looks like she's in a wedding dress and he's hugging her and he's holding a camera facing a mirror so he's taking a picture in the mirror of mm-hmm. him smiling and her back and he's like hugging her Recently, at the or it was around the time of the Rust shooting that happened, Mm -hmm. Eliza Hutton, his fiance, posted that picture on Instagram. So that was really them. My heart. When I was researching, I saw that picture that she had posted, and then when I was rewatching the movie, I saw that picture in the movie. I'm gonna have to go back and catch that myself now yeah so just a little real life to movie i'll 
touch I'll touch on that in a little bit reminds me of something coming up so another note he had a very philosophical viewpoint of the world he went on a camping trip when he was about 19 or 20 and he ended up in a meadow when a rainstorm hit his tent was old and had holes in it and while he was sheltering he wrote journal entries which he did a lot so I just have a little quote that I want to read from one of his days because it just shows how dramatic he was as a person <laughs> in his writing. And remember, this is as a 19 or 20 year old. So here it goes. Day five, I'm depressed again. This trip, which was supposed to save me, is failing. I'm having extremely fatalistic feelings. I'm in the woods now, alone. Right now, I wish I had some other people around. This small blue tent has become a prison of sorts. Outside, it's raining, and if it rains much harder, I am going to die. Literally, I am far from help, and it is cold and wet. Never have I been alone for this long. The tent is sagging around me, and a flood of water is rushing into the meadow. I want to go home. If the weather doesn't improve tomorrow, I may snap. <laughs> yeah, she definitely has a flair for the dramatic. Very much so. Another journal entry from one of his solo camping trips. And this is where I want to leave it because I just, I don't know why this, this little entry was just very um, emotional to me. Gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. The sun is out. The sky is blue. Few black clouds mar the horizon. Time passes slow up here. I will make a concerted effort to concentrate on it alone. Yeah. And that's just... A little insight into who he was. Which honestly sounds like he was a pretty amazing person. Hello, my name is Keely, and I am the host of a Paranormal and True Crime podcast. On my podcast, Missing Mysteries, I take a special focus on unsolved and missing persons cases. When I started my podcast, it was solely for the fact that I wanted to help people whose stories have not been shared. Over the year I have had it, it has evolved to be so much more, even adding a paranormal side. With the addition to a paranormal side, each week I cover a different topic. One week it will be an unsolved or a missing person, and the next week it will be a paranormal topic. Sometimes these blend together and will be two-parters where I cover the crime and the haunting in places such as Bobby Mackey's Music World, Felicia Axe Murder House, the Amityville House, Lizzie Borden's Home. If any of these sound like topics you would like to listen to, please check out Misty Mysteries anywhere where you listen to your favorite podcasts. And I really do hope to see you next week on my podcast, Misty Mysteries. Filming took place at Carol Coe Studios in Wilmington, North Carolina. And while it is well known that Brandon was tragically killed on set, there are a number of other accidents on and offset while filming that caused the talk of the curse of the crow. The first incident occurred on February 1st, 1993. On the first day of filming, when 27-year-old Jim Martitius suffered burns to his face, arms, and chest. Fellow carpenter on set Chris Crowder relayed the events leading up to Jim's accident and a lawsuit filed against Carol Co. Studios by Jim and his wife Cindy. He stated that Jim was operating a JLG boom lift, or like cherry picker, when the basket came into contact with the power lines, Chris had had his back to Jim when it happened, so all he heard was the spark and explosion. When the crew ran to Jim, he was slumped over the control panel on fire. Oof. An excerpt from the lawsuit describing his injuries, quote, plaintiff was burned over 40 to 45 percent of his body. He was blinded in his right eye and suffers from a residual neurological problem of poor balance. Plaintiff's burns cause severe facial and bodily disfigurement requiring reconstructive surgeries, end quote. Ouch. Yeah, no good. On the very same day Jim was injured, unit publicist Jason D. Scott was involved in a minor car accident. And that evening, a Crow equipment truck mysteriously caught fire. An article on April 2nd, 1993, outlined the other various accidents that occurred. My good grief. Yeah, that's a lot. A disgruntled sculptor who had worked on the set for several days apparently went berserk on the back lot and drove a car through the studio's plaster shop. According to a production source, he was, quote, a brilliant sculptor, but he was impossible to deal with. Needless to say, he was immediately let go, end quote. What, the, what was he so disgruntled about? <laughs> oh, no. Construction workers slipped and drove a screwdriver through his hand. It was serious, says publicist Scott, but it's not like he's going to lose the use of his hand. 
a drive-by shooting occurred not far from a Crow location in downtown Willington. The alleged perpetrator was actually stopped by one of our barriers, says Scott. So in a way, we were contributing to the justice system. In a way, you could look at that as like a positive and not a negative. Yeah. I don't... There was there was still a, a drive-by shooting that happened. Yeah, none of, <laughs> none of that is good. The final blow came when a March 13 storm that destroyed Crow sets, as well as some from Ethan and Joel Cohen's The Hudsucker Proxy, they were also filming on the Carolco lot. This was commonly referred to the storm of the century. Hmm. It produced over $2 billion in property damage across portions of states, including portions of the set for the Crow. It only damaged a portion of the back lot, but the filmers were no longer using that area anymore anyway. Two billion in 1993. That's a lot of moolah. Yikes. Okay, so on March 30th, 1993, they were 50 days into their 58-day shoot and filming some of the early scenes in the movie. The scene they were working on is actually at the very beginning of the movie, the scene in which the character Brandon plays, Eric, is murdered. In the scene, he was to be shown walking up the stairs holding a bag of groceries as he enters his apartment and interrupts the gang attacking his fiance. Fun Boy, played by Michael Massey, was to shoot him from 15 feet away with blanks. Lee would then flip a switch connected to the grocery bag, activating squibs. Bullet hit squib or blood squib, which is like a firecracker device that is used to simulate a gunshot. Mm -hmm. This scene had been practiced several times without issue. However, this time the production team had made several crucial mistakes. You know, as a kid, I always thought that like when they shot movies, they shot them literally in sequence from like start to finish. So when Same. I got older and learned that it was all over the place, it kind of blew my my mind. Yeah, same. I always thought that too. I don't feel like it was until probably late high school or college, maybe <laughs> even when I went to school for like media film that mm -hmm. I realized that it was yeah. not shot. They jump in around. Sequence. So Dave Brown, he is a firearm safety specialist in the industry, and he was interviewed about Brandon's death back in 2014. He stated that his death wasn't the result of one big mistake, but rather a chain of contributing factors instead. Two weeks prior to Brandon's death, production needed some dummy cartridges, but had run out. So they went and purchased real cartridges from a nearby gun store, pried off the bullets, poured out the gunpowder, and stuck the bullets back in the cases. This is highly dangerous because the primers are still live. When the primer is live and you pull the trigger, it can cause the bullet to move forward an inch or two, even without gunpowder and no sound accompanying it. In this case, the props assistant took out the cartridges from the gun, but didn't know how to clean the gun or check the barrel for obstructions. Two weeks later, the same gun is loaded with blanks and used to shoot at Brandon in the scene. A dummy bullet is just like a live round as it has the bullet, but there's no gunpowder and the primer isn't live. These are used in close-up shots to simulate a real bullet. A blank has the gunpowder, but no bullet. It usually has a piece of paper or felt holding the gunpowder in place. Okay. In this case, there was no firearms expert on site to help make sure the gun was over before being used or to be sure to instruct the actor that was firing the weapon to aim to the side to cheat mm -hmm. the angle so the firearm isn't pointed directly at the other actor. When actor Michael Massey, fun boy, fired the gun at Brandon, the blank caused the bullet from the dummy to be dislodged and propelled it out of the barrel of the gun with the same explosive force as a real cartridge. Of course, to the crew, everything played out as it should have. Massey fired the gun, Brandon was hit, blood sprayed, and Brandon fell down. It was only when he didn't get back up that they realized something was wrong. Brandon was rushed to Hanover Regional Medical Center in Wilmington via ambulance. He was still alive. Or he still had vital signs when he arrived at the hospital and doctors immediately took him back for emergency surgery to try to repair, to repair the damage done by the bullet. It had created a quarter sized hole in his lower right abdomen. It perforated his stomach and hit other vital organs before resting next to his spine. Despite their best efforts, the doctors were unable to repair the damage caused, and Brandon Lee was pronounced dead at the hospital at 1.03 p.m. on March 31st, 1993, 12-plus hours after the shooting. Brandon was laid to rest next to his father in Lakeview Cemetery in Seattle, Washington, on April 3rd, 1993. Oh, it's so sad. So naturally, production was immediately halted after Brandon's death, but the question of whether or not they were going to finish the movie came up right away. For the director, Alex Proyas, the decision was extremely difficult as he had gotten close with Brandon over time. The question really wasn't whether or not they could finish the movie. Most of Brandon's scenes were already completed. It was if they should. Yeah, that makes sense. 
So Eliza, Brandon's fiance, played a vital role in the decision to finish the movie. She felt that Brandon ultimately would have wanted the movie to be completed. So she agreed to have them finish it and they pressed on. So when you said earlier that one of the photos you saw in the movie was actually of them, Mm -hmm. makes sense now. Yeah. Ah. Proyas himself took to rewriting the script as the unshot scenes were meant to focus on Eric and Shelley's love and devotion to each other and to fully explain the motive behind Eric's back from the dead revenge. At the time of Brandon's death, they were only eight days from wrapping, but for the few scenes left to be completed, they used a handful of different techniques. A noted example is the scene in which Eric sports his signature makeup for the first time. They used stunt performer Chad Stileski to stand in for him, and then previously recorded footage of Brandon's face was digitally grafted onto Stileski's body in post-production. It worked pretty seamlessly as as Stileski was Brandon's stunt double throughout the movie anyway. The original scene in which Brandon was shot and ultimately killed was not in the final release of the movie either. Instead, they re-recorded the scene using stunt doubles and used the same digital grafting method as described before when you could see his face. Unfortunately, after his death, Paramount Studios declined to pick it up and many other studios refused to produce the film as they said it would be too difficult to propose to the public. Eventually, it was picked up by Miramax, who added a dedication in the ending credits for Brandon and Eliza. That gets me every time I see the end of that movie. Same. As for the actor who played fun boy, Michael Massey, he was so messed up after Brandon's death that he left acting for a year. And even up until his death in 2016, he had never watched the movie himself. I feel so bad for him. It's, you know, I mean, it's just this horrible accident and he had to be the one to pull the trigger. And then yep. he has to just deal with that for the rest of his life. I uh, would have messed me up too. Yeah. I don't know that I would have been able to see watch the movie either. No, not at all. I'm just knowing. I mean, you wouldn't even knowing that that scene isn't him in the yeah. in the released version. There's no way you'd be able to make it through that. The Crow was finally released on May 11th, 1994, grossing over 11 million opening weekend at the box office. It had an original $15 million budget that was later increased to 23 million after the passing of Brandon when they had to use the digital grafting to complete the movie. The movie has made a total of around $93 million worldwide. I'm surprised it's not more than that. I'm not though, because I knew... Of the movie, I mean, obviously it wasn't a movie that I was able to watch when I was super, super young. My parents aren't that crazy. (laughs) (laughs) But when I was introduced to it, I mean, it became my favorite movie and I was obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. But most of my other friends, most of the other people that I knew, they had no idea this movie even existed. That's true. To be honest, I think you're the one who introduced me to this movie. I would not be surprised. Yeah, thinking about it now, I'm pretty sure you are the one who introduced me to this movie. (laughs) You're welcome. Thank you. (laughs) Glad I could contribute. So that's the story of Brandon Lee and the Crow in a nutshell. There's probably a lot of stuff that we didn't cover, but there are a few other little miscellaneous things I want to touch base on. James O'Barr noted that nearly all the money he made from the film was donated to children's charities, and he had nothing to do with the subsequent sequels or the TV show followed. But he is a consultant on the reboot movie of The Crow starring Bill Skarsgård. Since he became friends with Brandon on the set of filming, he didn't feel right profiting off the money made from the unexpected success of the film. Which I appreciate, but I also don't know how I feel that there's going to be a reboot. You know, I love Bill. Mm -hmm. He was perfect Pennywise. And I'm going to go into it with an open mind Mm -hmm. because I like Bill and that James is still part of it, being still part of it. So I'm going to go into it with an opening mind. But personally, for me, there will never be another Eric Draven. Brandon Lee is Eric Draven. I Yeah, I agree. Uh, another little fun tidbit about, I think we had kind of talked about this earlier, but this is something, you know, I did a lot of research, what I could on James. And Brandon had told James for the very first time in his entire life that he was working on a project and didn't feel like Bruce Lee's son. The Crow was his film and he put his heart and soul into it. One of my favorite things that James has said in regard to the sequels that came out, however, was that he was against them and felt that they would cheapen Brandon's legacy in his mind. However, it seemed to have the opposite effect and just made Brandon look that much better. It makes me so sad that he was like, yes, I'm finally who I want to be. Yep. Everything is falling into place for him. And I've got a few quotes from fellow actors and other members on set. Rochelle Davis, who was 13, who played Sarah, said, quote, 
He was one of the nicest people. The only thing I didn't like about him was he didn't like dogs. <laughs> he hated them because he said they always bit him. Me and my mom told him we were going to get him a dog for his wedding. And he said he'd walk it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I agree. It's, yeah, dogs are the best. How do you not like dogs? <laughs> I just I love his his I'm gonna, response. I'm going to walk I, it. I'm going to walk it. <laughs> W-O-K. Yeah. I'm going to walk it. Another quote, Jeff Most was one of the co-producers of the film. Before we went to Wilmington, Brandon was so pleased. I remember him saying, you know, whatever happens with this project, nothing is as important to me as the fact that I am playing Eric Draven. This is my finest character. And it was. It, yeah, it was. I mean, he didn't have a very long career. No. But by far, I... I I don't know. He could have done something later in life that would have blown my mind completely. But I feel like this would have always been my favorite project of his. For a lot of reasons. For a lot I, of reasons. Yeah. Let's see. Lance Anderson, uh, Brandon's makeup artist on set, said, while doing Brandon's makeup, I had to keep low key because if I started talking, it would set Brandon off on a story. And we would be in for an extra half hour of makeup. <laughs> he loved Game Boy. He was addicted to it. I'd be painting these delicate lines on his face and he'd hit a point on the game and it would be time for a cleanup job. <laughs> so I could just imagine him playing the game, getting into it and like flailing and having. I think it's funny because it also shows him as kind of just like a typical boy, you know, just yep. sitting there playing this game while he gets his makeup done and then he twitches and he's got a line like coming up his face. And then it shows that goofy side of him that we were we were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Final quote. This is actually from James Abar himself. When he filmed the sequence coming out of the grave, it was five degrees. They had to put alcohol in the rain machines to keep the liquid from freezing. And all Brandon had on were his pants. But he did the scene over and over until he got it exactly as he wanted it. He was a hell of a trooper. It just shows he was dedicated to this role and he was determined to make it great. And in my personal opinion, he did. He did. It's it's a great movie. And it's always stuck with me since you showed it to me the first time. But even just the rewatch, especially being older and rewatching it, mm -hmm. you can appreciate it that much more for yep. what he did with that role. Yep. And you can tell that it really meant a lot to him. And that concludes the story behind The Crow and Brandon Lee. If you're a fan of the movie and Brandon Lee, reach out to us and tell us why this movie resonates with you. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or TikTok. Our handle is at Weird True Crime. We'll be posting pictures from the movie and of Brandon there. I found some really, really great ones from some of those People Magazine articles that mm -hmm. I hadn't seen before mm -hmm. that just show him in just the best, the best light. One thing that we'll include is the picture of Brandon was laid to rest next to his father. And there's a picture of both of their headstones and we've got a picture or written what the inscription is in the, in the inscription is really amazing too. It really is. And yeah, like Amber said, we'll be sure to include all of that on all the socials and I'll get it on the website eventually as well. So you can find us there too at Weird True Crime. And yeah, it's being updated slowly, but surely, but definitely make sure you follow us on all the socials because that's where everything is constantly getting updated with new information all the time. Be sure to check in on Halloween Day to listen to the Halloween sleepover stories with all of the different podcasts in the Darkcast Network. It's going to be super awesome and you will get to hear a fun-ish story that I tell about the haunted houses that Amber and I grew up in. So make sure you come back and check that out and listen to all of our other fellow podcasters tell their fun, spooky stories. And until then, stay safe and get spooky. Bye. Bye. Bye.